Welcome back to Banfield, a killer who sketched his victims before brutally stabbing them. The man known as the Doodler terrorized San Francisco in the 1970s. At least five victims have been directly linked to him, but some people think that number could be much higher. For nearly 50 years, it looked like we would never know the Doodler's true identity. Now that could be about to change, though. The case has been reopened. The reward has been doubled, and police say they think they may have just found a sixth victim. I'm joined by Kevin Fagan. He is a reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle who has covered the case extensively. He also is the host of the podcast called The Doodler, all about this investigation. Um, thanks so much for being on, Kevin. This is such a fascinating turn to hear that there may be some movement in this now half century old case. I'm curious about this potential sixth victim, because as I understand it, uh, the other victims were stabbed. This victim was beaten with a tree branch and a rock. Why do they mm -hmm. think they're connected? Well, uh, the theory is that the doodler attacked Warren Andrews on a bluff overlooking the ocean in a place called Land's End. And Andrews got up and fought him, and the knife went flying over the cliff, so the doodler picked up the nearest weapons at hand, which was a rock and a tree branch, and he finished it off. Wow. Uh then there's also this contention that five, maybe six victims uh, is actually really undercutting the, the true number. Some think it's as many as 14 victims. Why is that? Well, as many as 17, actually, it, because you got to remember, this was the early mid 70s when uh, the gay rights movement was exploding in San Francisco. It was, it was also illegal, essentially, to be gay. There were sodomy laws on the books, cross-dressing laws on the books. And... Um, a lot of a lot of horrible things were happening with gay men. They were getting beaten, uh, more stabbings and and shootings and beatings than you know I could count when I was doing clip searches. Uh, and some of the cops that I talked to back in the day said they they'd come in and they couldn't solve them and they'd shelve them and they'd come in they couldn't solve them they'd shelve them. It was kind of off the hook. That was the time of the Zodiac killer, uh, the Patty Hearst kidnapping, the zebra killings. It was, a, it was a violent time, and gay men particularly took the brunt of that. It was a time of oppression. So the doodler found so, pretty good hunting grounds, actually. Right, with so few people maybe caring to even, uh, you know, put the, uh, to put the resources of the authorities um, on mm -hmm. these cases. It's just sort of tr just so tragic to think of that. The reason that we know about this doodling, um, because, you know, obviously if the, if the victims all died, how do we know? It turns out there's three... Right three people who may have survived this uh, this killer. One, a famous Hollywood entertainer of the time, mm -hmm. uh, two, a foreign diplomat, and three, a third mm -hmm. man who didn't return the calls of the police. Now, I am so fascinated about these men. They didn't want to come forward because they didn't want to be outed as gay. Do we know if they're still alive? Do we know if they have more story to tell? Do we know how much story mm -hmm. they told? The third man, uh, he actually did talk to the police. Uh, he was hogtied and attacked and stabbed, and he screamed so loudly that his neighbors chased the doodler away. Uh, he's dead, by all accounts. Um, and the, uh, the diplomat is still alive. Uh, the diplomat doesn't want to talk. The diplomat is still scared. I don't blame him. All these years later, the doodler is probably still alive. And the actor, I have a pretty good idea who the actor is, but... Uh, he doesn't want to come out of the closet, even all these years later. What about just to the police, though? I mean, I get it if he doesn't want to talk to you and me, right? But mm. um, to try to catch someone who did these horrific things and may emerge to do them again, because by our math, you know, he was said to be around 19 to 25 years old. And in the 70s, that would put him in his you know, 60s or 70s now, perfectly capable. Might those people speak yes. to the police? Are they speaking to the police? And are they helping in the case, even if they're not you know, going public? The diplomat is. He's talking to the police. He's, he's cooperative. The, the chief investigator in this case is a guy named Dan Cunningham. He called me oh three or so years ago uh looking for an old chronicle reporter who'd been the last one to write about this uh and i found that reporter and that reporter soon after died and uh, so i said dan you know tell me what's going on and we've been i've been working closely with him as a source since then he's pushing it hard he's uh he's scraping up new clues my partner mike taylor and i scraped up new clues 
uh, I have some pretty good hopes that this could actually bring and get brought home soon. Yeah, well, now you, me, and everybody who's watching this, I think, has that same hope, unless mm -hmm. that guy's watching. So, as I understand it, and clear this up for me, there was one very, very promising suspect, and the police really thought they had the guy. I'm curious if it was the reticence of the victims who said, don't you dare ask me to come into a public courtroom, not in this climate, uh, or if it was something more than that. And P.S., maybe DNS or D DNA wasn't uh, sophisticated back then. It sure is now. Where does all of that stand? There's some promising DNA in this case that has emerged, and that's uh, uh, from what Dan has done and what Mike and I have done. There are some promising tips that have emerged from the podcast that I did, which uh, got, you know, kind of went international. Uh, and so we got a lot of phone calls, a lot of, a lot of leads coming in. Um, uh, that's, you know, stitching things together. Dan doesn't want to give away his hand too much. Uh, of course, cause you know, if you spill all the details, they're no good in court, but there are, uh, it's, it's, it's looking, it's looking good. It's looking good. So, Kevin, they caught the Golden State Killer after decades uh, through genealogy. Do you know if they're mm. even in need of the genealogy? Because the genealogy just gets you to the guy, and then yeah. you do the investigation, right? Do they think they might actually have that guy now, and maybe they've got the proof they need for that guy, and they don't need the testimony from the men who don't want to admit that they were victims? Yeah, yeah back to your point earlier, the... Uh... Uh, the reason they couldn't bring it home is that the evidence wasn't good in this case in terms of uh, the guy getting sloppy. There was no dropped wallet, no dropped license, something like that. And, of course, the three people wouldn't talk. Um, uh, uh, the, the blood matches were no good. Uh, it, it just couldn't bring it home, but they were pretty sure that they, they had the right guy back then. Uh, one of the sticking points was there was a psychiatrist who called in and said, I've just interviewed your doodler. He's admitted to me that he's the doodler. He killed. Uh, come on over and get him. Well, the psychiatrist under law back then could not uh, be used as a witness in this. And, of course, the suspect denied everything, and the, and the investigation ground down. That was, that was it. And Mike and I have, we're pretty sure we found the psychiatrist from back then, and he's, he's dead. So he's not around to testify, and, and no one can find his notes. Wow. Okay, we're not done this conversation. I'm having you back, my friend. I feel like that you're on to something and it's, you know, it's starting to, to quiver and shake. So um, I hope you'll come back and talk to us a little bit more about this. Thank you so much, Kevin. Sure, thank you, Ashley. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.